Jack Ross, author of The Strange Death of American Exceptionalism, and uh, this book here, which I'll hold up, The Socialist Party of America, A Complete History. We wanted to discuss your book, The Strange Death of American Exceptionalism, in the context of the ongoing um, massacres in Gaza and the protest movements around the world, but in the United States in particular, um, and sort of as a follow-up to these two videos we did, one on the defense of uh, Barry Weiss and the other, uh, I titled it um, Artificial Protests. My additions to those videos, especially the second one on artificial protests, shifted the emphasis away from, I think, what your original aim was. Your outline was aimed at recontextualizing the massacres in Gaza and the occupation as a crisis, not only for Israel, but perhaps also for liberalism. You know, when I showed my son Noah the video on artificial protests, he asked me why I'd argued for a return to Christianity at the end of the video. And I tried to explain to him that I'd only argued for embracing the ethical principles that inform Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But he told me I was just being edgy. So this, I think, make, speaks to a mistake I made as I put the video together. I, I should have emphasized a different moment in the piece, the clip from the 1979 horror film, When a Stranger Calls, starring Carol Kane. Leave me alone! Jill, this is Sergeant Sacker. Listen to me. We've traced the call. It's coming from inside the house. A squad car's going over there right now. This is how I illustrated the idea that Jews were already experiencing integration into what I'll call a global society and that they were already experiencing secularization. That is, the primary threat to Judaism isn't coming from Islamic fundamentalists, contemporary Nazis, or any other outside force, but from the character of modern or contemporary Jewish life. So I want to ask you at the start here a, a pretty simple question that hopefully will lead into an expanded discussion, which is, what is a Jew? I'm almost reminded of a non-Jewish friend who, who once described uh, the Lubavitchers doing the are you Jewish, are you Jewish thing, and he just goes, how do I know if I'm Jewish? And when they said, do you have a Jewish mother? He said, how do I know if my mother was Jewish? And there is that uh, rabbinic definition of having a Jewish mother. The more liberal movements, or at least the largest of them, now will say one Jewish mother or father. The Israeli law of return will allow anyone with one Jewish grandparent, which was the same definition as Hitler, which um, is grim. One can up to a point understand in the immediate context after World War II. Um, I have a question for you. Are, are you a... Are you a Seinfeld fan? Of course, yes. Yeah. Brian Cranston played a, a dentist. You know, the guy from Breaking Bad, Walter White, Brian Cranston, Malcolm in the Middle. He played a dentist on Seinfeld. And in one of the episodes, he converts to Judaism. Um, and uh, Seinfeld is a little irritated by it because he thinks that the only reason uh cranston's character converted was because he wanted to be able to tell uh, jokes about jews and um and it wasn't so much that he was offended as a jew but as a comedian my question is this if that dentist who had converted to judaism and had married a a woman who had also converted to judaism had a child with her uh and then they both decided they were scientologists instead would that child be jewish that's a question. That, that's a question for for someone who really knows their Talmud or cares to know their Talmud. But I've often uh, said, if uh, if the one thing the '60s really did ruin was the musical, the one thing um, millennials really have ruined is Jewish humor. If, um, and most of the actual people who did it were Gen Xers, but. It, but just think about uh, the less well remembered, but perhaps in some ways best example is probably the Showtime series Weeds, but also Wet Hot American Summer. I mean, to put a very grim spin on my idealistic identification with uh, uh, the 
fusion of Judaism and Americanism or liberalism or whatever, um, I, uh, it actually was, of all people, Jerry Seinfeld in that episode who put it best about uh, this, what, about this kind of kitsch or even kitsch of kitsch that is secular Jewish identity in my lifetime, which was uh, no, it, when he said no, it offends me as a comedian. <laughs> the reason the whole question of what is a Jew is coming up is because we want to get to what does it mean to say that Israel is a Jewish state? And it seems natural to start with asking the question, what is a Jew? And it seems like we've come to the point where we're not so sure what, what constitutes a Jew. And so that puts us in a kind of awkward position when it comes to deciding what a Jewish state is. Israel's official religion is Orthodox Judaism. The UK's official religion is, is Christian, and the Church of England is the primary state church. The United States has no official religion. The U.S. Constitution, specifically the First Amendment, prohibits the creation of a state church or a state religion. But despite this, the majority of Americans are Christian. So the question comes up, could Israel still be a Jewish state um, if it were to take up the First Amendment from the U.S. Constitution? Historically, Jewish state did not mean in a religious sense, but in an ethno-national sense. And unpacking that is pretty much what this whole conversation is going to be about, because that's a very distinct and very outdated blood and soil idea. Given how the state has evolved over time, and certainly this is very much at the heart of uh, the protest movement before the massacres, which now seems to have more or less merged. Those protests before the massacres fundamentally came down to question of the Constitution, that Israel does not have a written Constitution. And the reasons for that, we can go into more, have very much to do with uh, the nature of the state and also because there were pretty much no check except the Supreme Court. It's, uh, it's, it is an insane system. It is a far more extreme version of the two emperor problem. Ross Stout had called it in the American context between Trump and John Roberts. But uh, um, any attempt to have a written constitution would certainly call all of the fundamental questions of what is meant by a Jewish state or the the ethno-national dimension of the Jewish state. And I mean, what's really motivates these protests, those pro, or, motive, or before the massacre certainly motivated those protesters was the specter of um, the religious establishment such as it's existed, having a lot more power and and setting policy and not having the judiciary as a check on it. And so I would argue that the very disgusting ethno-national dimensions that exist, you have ID laws based on nationality or ethnicity. I mean, the really one of the main really perverse things is the fact that there's no such thing as Israeli national identity as far as the state of Israel is concerned, only Jewish identity and the whatever the other degrees of classification are, whether it's uh, Arab citizens of Israel or Palestinian non-citizens or, or you may have a handful of other very particular obscure categories, but um, like that ID system and everything that, that goes along with it. I mean, I would argue, I mean, so like going back to the point, will nothing change if Netanyahu is out and the successor government would be just as awful. First of all, since the massacres, basically my attitude has just been get, get rid of Netanyahu first and then the rest, all the rest can be sorted out. But more to the point, there is no, I would argue, first, just your specific question, there is no, there, 
I don't, that has no national dimension and everything that comes with it, I do not believe could ultimately withstand uh, the unraveling or, or unmaking of the religious establishment. One really uh, fanatical and not somewhat unhinged uh, uh, right winger I watched on YouTube at, at the height of the protests before the massacres is saying this is all about are we a state for Jews or a Jewish state? I found that with whatever caveats, it's a somewhat useful um, framework for looking at, at the questions involved. You you directed me to read a piece by Noah Millman, a journalist who writes on Substack, and he published an essay entitled The World Only Spins Forward, Anti-Zionism Edition. And in that article, he claims that we're living in a post-Zionist era uh, and have been since 1948. I want to I want to get to more about what he said in his essay. But one thing I would point out that he said is that there are competing uh, understandings of what Israel is about. Um, there's uh, the understanding of Israel being a you know a religious or theocratic kind of state based on Judaism, but there's also uh, not even in opposition to that, but maybe alongside it, the I idea that uh, Israel is a refuge uh, from anti-Semitism. It's maybe a, a, the uh, option of last resort. Okay, that that just just quickly that is at the mo just the most short short baseline. That that is what is meant by the state for Jews or Jewish state distinction. As I laid out, just just to explain. I mean. It, it can get a lot more, there can be a lot more to it than that, but that in, in, in the most reducible fundamental sense is what that distinction means. A lot of my argument is that the whole national concept underlying, un underlying that is, is uh, not, is not really, uh, is, is, is pretty outdated or outmoded and I'll need to explain as we as we get deeper exactly what I mean by that but the idea of nationalism that underlies Zionist first principles um, is an anachronism which is exactly the word Tony Jude used in his essay in 2003 in 2003 the political historian Tony Judd outlined the impasse that had already been reached between Palestine and Israel, and his conclusions should be easy for today's activists to take up and understand. He wrote, The true alternative facing the Middle East in coming years will be between an ethnically cleansed greater Israel and a single integrated binational state of Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians. That is indeed how the hardliners in Sharon's cabinet see the choice and that is why they anticipate the removal of the Arabs as the ineluctable condition for the survival of a Jewish state. But what if there was no place in the world today for a Jewish state? What if the binational solution was not just increasingly likely, but actually a desirable outcome? It was not such a very odd thought. Most of the readers of this essay live in pluralist states, which have long since become multi-ethnic and multicultural. Christian Europe is a dead letter. Western civilization today is a patchwork of colors and religions and languages of Christians, Jews, Muslims, Arabs, Indians, and many others. Most Israel apologists react to that statement uh, by saying, no, we're, we're, the world has not embraced uh, uh, Kantian open border liberalism or whatever. And... I, and no, that that misses the point. There are many, um, there are many horrible, illiberal, violent, and totalitarian forms of government that exist in the world today. But none of them justify themselves on that classical. European blood and soil idea. Well, I mean that—that's we may come to the whole 
indigeneity argument, should that be a valid concept? Of, I certainly would argue that it's not, and, and perhaps Zionism is even the or the history of the state of Israel or the historic Zionist movement is a key illustration of why indigeneity should not be a concept in international law. Let's talk about Zionism and anti-Zionism. Noam, Noam Millman proposes that we're living in a post-Zionist era because Zionism was a project to establish a Jewish state, but now this has been accomplished. So in this post-Zionist era, we are left with a different task, attempting to determine just what such a Jewish state pretends and what the state of Israel's two true basis will be in the long run. And we've been discussing that in various ways. But um, he brings the question into focus by clearing away a confusion that he believes is pervasive amongst both Zionists and anti-Zionists. And that is, there appears to be a belief that we can go back and undo the past. There is an unexamined presumption of time travel. Anti-Zionists act as though the option of opposing the establishment of Israel is a live possibility. The presumption of time travel is to most Zionists and Israeli Jews profoundly threatening because it seems to point to the aim of cleansing what the anti-Zionists would call Palestine of Jews. Do you think, Jack, that if we somehow imposed a rule on anti-Zionists and Zionists alike, that they had to accept that history had happened, do you think that there could be a way to transform the question of Israel and, and, and Palestine into a question of how to establish um, a secular state in Israel, that there would be grounds for more cooperation if we let go of our presumption of, of our ability to time travel? Well, I was very struck by your by how you described the core message of, of Milman's article, because the way you said it, which I think is something he was trying to say, makes it sound a lot better than it did as I read it, because I wanted to agree with what he was saying in spirit. But the more times I read it, I was just completely driven up the wall. As I explained in the email to you, boiled right down to was he take he takes such good care as he usually does to lay out all of the just precision and definitions. But probably all boils down to he did not define Jewish state. So I mentioned earlier that there was this in the in the video about the protests. There was a clip from the 1979 horror film When a Stranger Calls, and in that. Um, clip carol kane has been getting phone calls from a, a, a murderer and a, a serial killer i think and when she hangs up from the serial killer she gets a call from the police and says the calls have been coming from inside the house um and so she has to you know escape her own house the i thought that was a good clip to use to illustrate the idea that the greatest threat to judaism or to Israel as a ethno-nationalist uh, Jewish state was coming from actually within Israel, and that uh, we should think about how. And this is to answer your 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 troubles with the term post-Zionism. If we accept post-Zionism as our stance, that we aren't time travelers, um, then we might notice how there are calls coming from within the house and that um, rather than post-Zionism firmly establishing the Zionist state, it in fact brings Israel into modernity. And now Israel has to face the secularization and the difficulties that define modernity. On that note, you had mentioned earlier that there were many protests against the Netanyahu regime um, before October 7th on the basis of trying, if I understand it correctly, resisting the rising up of a even more entrenched and uh, far-reaching uh, religi religious order within Israel. Um, do you think that uh, there could be movements within Israel 
that that would help transform uh the this uh, post zionist moment into uh a, a a world where israel could be for jews but not um a jewish state so first to clarify at least officially or facially uh those protests of a year ago had a much more limited goal which was to simply preserve the status quo of the supreme court that only was established in 80s or 90s i think an official bill of rights only first emerged in the early to mid 90s um uh, simply preserving the status quo against uh netanyahu's legislative attempt to overturn it the point the larger point i was making that led to your characterization which i don't mean to by any means describe as false is that is that the 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 kernel of truth on the Netanyahu side is it is a very strange and reckless and haphazard system. If you force the issue, you have to have a written constitution, which there was not uh, when the state was founded. You would simply it ba basically it's it's as if it's basically the British system with no formal constitution but without a monarch you simply uh, parliament simply class of art will just declare something a quote basic law and their first basic laws had to do with the transnational jewish nationhood principle the law of return and so forth as opposed to the actual uh functioning of the country or or rights or Bill of Rights or anything. Just to clarify that, I was also, uh, since you brought up Carol Kane, I'd never heard of her being in a horror movie, but uh, thinking about it uh, only a couple of years apart to her, her role in Annie Hall. You know, General Eisenhower is not touching. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. 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 And he said, boys, awesome. never worry. You, you like New York Jewish left-wing liberal intellectual, Central Park West, Brandeis University, the socialist summer camps, and the, the father with the Ben Sean drawings, right? And the really, you know, strike-oriented kind of... Uh, I'm stopping before I make a complete imbecile of myself. No, that was wonderful. I love being reduced to a cultural stereotype. Right, I'm a big, you know, but for the left. When he said socialist summer camps, and we don't know what kind, whether it was whether it was labor Zionist or Workman Circle or CP, this the Stevenson Association sort of implies CP or CP ish, but I guess a lot the, the kind of people who still sent their kids to work with Circle Sunday School in in the fifties sociologically were. Closer to that, but so too were a lot of the labor scientists of that era. So your book with Sublation is out right now, The Strange Death of American Exceptionalism, uh, is, I think, relevant when we're thinking about um, the question of the calls coming from within the House and the struggle. Um, Habermas talked about how modernity hadn't been completed, right? So the struggle to um, develop uh, a secular society of democratic nations, and I would say as a Marxist, based on uh, the self overcoming of free uh, free labor. But, but in any case, the struggle for modernity to be realized um, is, uh, on the one hand, you know, sort of unavoidably uh, rising up in Israel and um, and in and in Palestine or Gaza as well. But on the other hand, um, it seems to be that the necessity for that struggle seems to be uh, suppressed uh, in the core, in the United States. And your book, The Strange Death of American Exceptionalism, takes up the notion that woke ideology is actually a kind of religion, and it treats that idea seriously. There have been a lot of people who've said that in kind of a flippant way, um, mostly on the right, but you, you take that idea 
seriously. So of an ideology to support the administrative state, the deep state, the bureaucratic state as a managing force over society um, took off after 9-11, that, it, that Wilson was reborn through George W. Bush. <clears throat> and then you point out something really interesting in your book and outrageous, which is that you say that um, uh, you, what you argue <clears throat> that the George, Bush, George W. Bush administration's assault on free society um, was uh, continued, and it's basically you say any effort to reverse or confront the George W. Bush administration's assault on the cause of a free society, um, suppressing it by means of a wide-ranging and illiberal national... Oh, wait, let me just start one more time. You say that in 2013, the Democrats and the left took the last and most decisive step in abandoning any effort to reverse or confront the George W. Bush administration's assault on the values of a free society, suppressing it by means of a wide-ranging and illiberal national racial reckoning, very largely focused on evil safely beyond the reach of living memory. In other words, we maybe <clears throat> are needing a time machine again in, in this moment. Uh, to be even more clear, you are arguing that BLM objectively reinforced the security state's agenda and helped to usher in more draconian measures, giving the state more control over civil society. That that, that that was the outcome of the Black Lives Matter moment in 2013 and 2014. Okay, so I would question some of those particulars, but that was the overall objective or idea behind it. I mean, there were other... I mean, this also coincided with uh, the aftermath of uh, the, the financial crisis and uh, um, then in Silicon Valley, assuming the commanding heights of the American economy as, as the key, uh, as, as the central fact behind all of the social and cultural and political upheaval that followed, I, um, which is why I say for all the ways I may be, uh, I may have become more conservative as I knock on the door of middle age. I, um, I'm more of a Marxist than I've ever been. Um, but, um, um, so, I mean, to finish the point I was making as far as, well, I think well, I mean, I think a lot. I think a lot of people from uh, from from uh, from corporations uh, uh, reorienting their uh, their social action uh, uh, PR, and if not in other cases, more than. PR or, or even just the simple marketing side of things, or, I mean, I think it is underappreciated the more I look back of how much of what's happened with sim whether in, whether in, I remember one particular conversation we had about this in the case of Hollywood, but whether it was, whether it's Hollywood or, um, or a number of other places that, uh, and I, and, and indeed I believe or, um, the late Ernest Evans, my mentor to whom the book is dedicated, um, he certainly always said this about Black Lives Matter. That it was just that in that mid-decade period, it was just a very cynical formulation by the Hillary campaign to just juice black turnout or whatever. But my point being that that how many things I think. The, the, it, it, I think uh, it's not sufficiently appreciated. We're merely set in motion by uh, by Hillary Clinton and her campaign as she prepared her campaign and wanting to pull all of these different le lever, lever, levers to to calibrate uh, the wider cultural or national discussion or backdrop 
to her campaign and how it empowered young radicals she did not understand and just went completely completely haywire. In the video that we made together, I pointed out, but a big long section of pointing out that the, today's contemporary protests are funded by the Democratic Party through the Tides Foundation in various ways, right? And in your book, you castigate the media establishment around 2013 for failing to apply the same standards of journalism to these movements uh, uh, for a racial reckoning that they had to the Tea Party movement, not noting the way a network of NGOs and other uh, operatives were funding and directing the... Well, in the last couple of years, I mean, there's, I think people have started to become a good deal wiser to that. I mean, I'll never forget, um, I'll never forget the time Matt Iglesias just randomly on Twitter said, he just said, you know, Glenn Beck really was more right than wrong. Well, if you want to talk about the kinds of uh, um, whether properly classified as neocon narratives or not, um, that uh, that's a whole other discussion. But uh, but certainly in, in Glenn Beck's case, a very distinct, uh, definitely Mormon version of. I mean, I, I wasn't anticipating that that you'd go into Tides Foundation and Palestine protests. Certainly, rele certainly relevant enough. I felt like I wanted to quibble there because because the way you framed it as being all about uh, within the Democratic Party. I think within a month or so of the massacres, of first really seeing it for what it was, what I said then is still basically right. That basically. This should be understood as the weatherman stage of the whole uh, phenomenon of, of wokeness or intersectionalism. And certainly that's consistent with the involvement of the Tides Foundation. But um, you can certainly make a case for um, what, is, what is happening in Gaza being worthy of a serious concerted campaign possibly invo involving civil disobedience to try to uh, do something about american complicity or whatever but but even to say that is to is to i mean it would never occur to any of these people to make it about to to to, to borrow a phrase move from protest to politics well, it would mean being disciplined and understanding why you have to why you have to appeal to hearts and minds. I mean, I mean, Andrew Sullivan went so far as to as to draw contrast with the civil rights movement, and uh, um, so he had discipline. Uh, knowing how to appeal to hearts and minds, uh, uh, seeking openness and engagement and, um, and, me and media and connotation rather than, rather than keeping people out, out of, out of, uh, out of segregated spaces or wearing masks or, what have you. Um, I have to say also, I am extremely, I have, I, I am extremely grateful that I had this experience of this rediscovery of intellectual passion and such before the massacres. Cause I, cause I, I mean, the kind of dark places I might've found myself going to with that level of despair, um, I am glad I did not have to experience. Well, I'm glad we're glad to, that you you discovered sublation. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. 
If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.